sectors. From 1988 to 2013, Chris Manage was the Managing Director of Human Kinetics Australia and New Zealand, a world leader in the provision of resources to all areas of sports science. Then in 2013, Chris was commissioned by the South Australian National Football League to set up and manage the South Australian Football League's History Centre. She's going to talk to us about today about how that was set up, where it is now, the challenges and surprises they've come across, and their vision for the future. Rotarians and guests, please welcome Chris Halbert. Thanks very much, Darcy. Now, I hope you can hear me because I don't want to be too loud. I'm not too keen on microphones, so am I fine here? Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm pretty impressed that this Rotary Club is 93 years old because um, in the scheme of things, that's some history. And then I look at the SANFL History Centre, which is coming up to 140 years next year. Um, I've got some, I brought some photos from the 20s in case you wanted to look, uh, have a look and see what people were wearing when they played football when this club started. Um, this started because when we were going home from um, Hall of Fame dinners or McGarry Medal dinners, I would say to John, someone's got to do something with this memorabilia because I would look around the room and there were all these people who have contributed not only to football, but to the state and also many areas. And they would be this fantastic history there. And we knew several people who didn't quite know what to do with their extensive memorabilia. So this went on and I'd say, somebody's got to do something with this. So when I decided to retire, because my bucket list was getting very long, um, I submitted a first project to the Sample Commission, which was to update the McGarry Medal Book. Now, there's a copy of that over there, which was by John Wood, and he died in 1987. So the book was the history of the McGarry Medal up until that point. So it really needed to be updated. It needed to be updated as an e-book so that we could add to it each year. And we've got a wonderful uh, uh, example of that on the, web on the Sanford website. Um, Jeff Kingston wrote the text. John Halbert proved it, Brian Charlton took amazing photos of the McGarry medals, and Phil Gib Gibson assembled it as an e-book. So it's really worth having a look at. It's only 9.95, but it's fantastic. Then after that, um, I wrote to the commission and said, why don't we set up a history centre? Because that had been talked about over the years, but there were always other, um, other priorities, including the development of this eventually. Um, and to their credit, they suggested that that would be a good idea. And I would like to commend John Lyons and Diane McCaffrey for being part of pushing that, um, that project. So thank you very much, John. Um, we set up in two offices at Football Park. And that was fine to start off with, but then we kept finding more photographs and items and more kept coming in. So eventually we had items in about five different offices. And that was fine until some of my volunteers who are no spring chickens would get lost going between office to office. So then we decided that perhaps we'd better have, have everything consolidated. And also Football Park was being wound down. So we looked around and found premises at Bowden in that new development. And fortuitously, we are above the Lutheran National Archives, which seems a pretty good match for us. Uh, we've been there almost a year now, and it's working very well. We have an enormous range of items. Um, I think about 5,000 at this time, and it's increasing. That's not counting some that we haven't even got to yet. So we've got this process where, that we work through and then photograph them all and enter them. So it's a long process. I suspect that we'll double or triple that over the next few years if we all live long enough. Um, we have wonderful photographs from the 1880s. I've brought one that says um, Menindi um, uh, Football Club, and it's the precursor to Adelaide Oval, and that's from the 1880s. 
Um, and then we've got some wonderful overhead shots of Adelaide Oval in the 50s, uh, 50s and 60s. Um, with, and they've got information like the total number who attended, the takings, and um, it's just superb. So hopefully you'll be able to see some of those next year. Um, they don't only show the oval, but they show North Adelaide and the buildings at that point in time, especially the one from 1946, which is interesting. And then it also shows the city buildings and further south. So they are really worth seeing and they're about this big, so they're superb. And there are a lot of people who come in of a certain age and say, I was in that crowd, <laughs> but they haven't identified their exact spot. Um, there are also wonderful collages of championships which began in 1908. And so they, periodically every three years, and they're players, administrators, scores, and beautifully done. So some of those need a little bit of tender loving care, which we'll get to, but they really are spectacular. We also have, as you would expect, we have clothing. We have a diverse range of Guernseys, socks, shorts, a couple of hats, boots, ties, blazers, and many footballs. Over there I have brought a white football which has got many McGarry Medal signatures on, and they go back to people like Brock from 1940, um, and people who I've come across over the years. I mean, I've only been going to football for 49 years. Um, and the other little football was actually produced when Lindsay Head won his third McGarry Medal, and that was John Mahaffey's sports store produced that as, a, as a, an item, um, special item. So it's a dear little thing about that big. Um, one other area that we've got is the plans, the photos and the plaques about the development of Football Park, including the lighting um, problems, etc., etc. We've got lovely photos of Sir Mark Oliphant and the shovel um, digging at the first sod. And that, that collection is unique because we will not be finding any of those items anywhere else. And so they've been digitised as a program, but also the items are kept, um, and that, that is unique. Um, another significant section of this collection, and we found that it's not a matter of items just coming in, but then various projects developed from there, uh, we've got the digitisation of about 135 scrapbooks, ranging from Fred Saxby's 1920-something, including Hartley Bagshaw, that's Paul's dad's 1940s scrapbook when Sturt won the premiership, and some from, some from Peter Darley, Philip Nelson, Rick Davies, Jim Dean, Malcolm Greenslade, John Halbert, Bob Hank, Don Roach, Paul Bagshaw, Bob Shearman, Peter Carey, Ron Hewitt, Malcolm Whitford, Elmore Lesky, and Malcolm S. Jones. Um, I, we haven't got Lindsay Heads yet because we just need to wait a bit until we've got space, but he's got 14 scrapbooks that wide and so is John. So there's a lot of history um, in all of those scrapbooks. And what we'd like to do for the exhibition, which I'll explain in a minute, for next year, is have screens where you can go on scrapbooks, then you can identify the individual you want to see the scrapbook about, then you might identify the period, and then you can tap on that and then turn it to see the information. And perhaps people won't want to go home, they just want to stay at the State Library for weeks. Um, so, and also to do these, this variety of projects, there are approximately 25 volunteers with tasks ranging from initial cataloguing, which can be a little um, unpredictable and creative when the chaps are talking about, oh, do you remember when he kicked five goals from the forward pocket and it was raining and then they get a little distracted, but that's fine, it's all good. Um, then we have a group of people who enter this data into the computer, having photographed it too, so that we can search. And then we have digitising scrapbooks and we have cataloguing umpire materials and now we've got a couple of people who are actually specifically only doing research. So that is our structure at the moment, and it's taken a while to get to that point, um, but it's really worthwhile to, for people to develop their own skills and then decide what they want to do at, at that time. Um, one of the other, 
One of the other parts of what we do is we heard that Channel 9 and Channel 2 were no longer needing their films and tapes of football from 50s onwards. So we have uh, signed contracts with them so that we can't sell anything, not that we want to sell it, and we have footage from 9 to 10 and 7. That has been catalogued and now we are about to start the process of digitising it because we'd like it out on YouTube in the public domain um, and that is actually the easy part. The hard part is the one inch tapes, uh, film and all of the other specialist areas that need um, special machines to actually play them and each month there, there are a few of those available. So if you know of anybody who has that sort of technology, um, please let us know because there aren't many of them around and we need that to look at the film to see what we, um, what we need to digitise and what the quality is. Um, we will have that as much as we can for that sort of film digitised um, in the exhibition too. Now to the exhibition. Next year, we will have an exhibition in the Institute building of the State Library, not just the front room, but rooms behind and into the newer part. Um, and this will have a whole range of items on display and quite a bit of technology, we hope. The centrepiece will be a display of McGarry medals. And up until now, the most McGarry medals that I think have ever been in one place is about 16, and we hope to have over 50. Um, and they'll be well lit so that they'll just be a focal point. You will see over there, I've brought Malcolm Blight's 72 medal and Jim Dean's two medals, 53 and 57. Um, before 1991, each of them were unique. And so the designs are absolutely beautiful um, and they're works of art. Then from 1991, the decision was made to have a generic medal because more than one person was winning it, so you don't really want to be, you know, developing 18 karat gold, two of them, and then only use one, so that they, they're now um, generic in a sense. So you can have a look at one of those there from Jimmy Dean, um, but to have that many medals on display will be spectacular. And also, when we were working with, to, towards the E, the McGarry Medal e-book, uh, we have identified 119 of the 126 medals that are in existence. There are some interesting stories that come out about people who, one, I won't remember, I won't mention names, but one said um, the person who came runner up, this is in the first decade of the 20th century, said, I should have won that medal. And the other chap who actually won it threw it at him and said, well, you can have it, but it'll never have your name on it. And that story's come from several parts, so I don't know how, how true that is. Um, so that's, that'll be pretty exciting. At the moment, we've got 14 McGarry medals, the Sandville has, and you will see there are three Fitzgerald, Len Fitzgeralds, um, and there's one Harold Hawke, and there's Malcolm Blight's, Jimmy Dean's, and you've now got Lindsay Head's and Barry Robrins, and 1934 John, Blue Johnstons as well. So gradually they're coming in as families think, what are we going to do with this unique item? And there is also one person who will remain, remain nameless who hid it somewhere really well so that the family could not lose it, and now he can't find it. <laughs> so the family aren't very pleased with him. So. Um, the other project, another project we're working on is interviewing significant people involved with football. And not just players, but administrators, umpires and media. So far we've interviewed Lee Wicker, Wally Miller, Ken Cunningham and tomorrow it will be Neil Curley. Um, the list is long and we'll work our way through it. And at least parts of those interviews will be shown at the exhibition next year. But it's really important not just to get one sentence grabs from these people, but to get reflections. And the interviews we've done so far have been between 80 and 90 minutes. Now, they will be edited, um, but it's just being the, having the opportunity to actually reflect on some of the aspects of these people's lives. So that's really important. Um, the other 
pleasing result of setting up the Sandville History Centre is the fact that the clubs now feel as if there's a focus for their, their memorabilia. Um, we've organised three meetings a year where football people, historians and other interested parties come together and exchange issues, discuss various things. One thing we did do last year that was very successful was have a football antiques roadshow. And that really worked well because the groups brought along items and then there was a discussion about what they're actually worth and how unique they are. And that, you can't predict any of that. It's quite, it's quite interesting. Plus, they feel now that they're a part of this whole spectrum of football history. Um, over there, if you get a chance, I have brought a whole series of mainly old photographs because they, they seem to be most unique in their, they got character. And there's a, a sort of um, a caricature of John that we can't identify. So if any of you know that you recognise your great uncle's work, you let me know. Um, there's also a statue which is bronze and uh, marble. And it, it, it was given by Palacco to John in 1958. We cannot find a thing about it. Now, it's spectacular, but we just don't know. Um, this year, last year, we applied for a National Community Heritage Grant for a significance assessment so that somebody goes through the whole collection and has a really good analysis of it. And we won, and this has been a very useful and worthwhile process. So to finish off, I would like to quote from that report, and it says, the South Australian National Football League collection has historical and social significance at a national and state level. The Sandville and its earlier variants is the oldest continuing competitive football association of any football code in Australia. The first association, the South Australian Football Association, was established on the 30th of April 1877, just one week prior to the formation of an equivalent association in Victoria. Yes. It's <laughs> Its position in Australian cultural and social history, one might sportingly argue, is uncontested. Although one might argue that the collection is predictable in that the types of items in the collection are found in most sports-based collections around Australia and indeed internationally, the significance of the Sandville collection is drawn from its particular historical context. Australian football was played within the framework of the working, recreational, social, demographic, democratic, economic, political, patriotic and physical environments that defined and continue to define South Australia and its people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, we do have a, about five minutes for questions. Uh, I might start off, Chris. The, the material that's digitised, is it um, going to be readily accessible or are you keeping it for the exhibition and what will happen after that? Um, we would like to have as much as possible in the public domain. So um, before the exhibition, I suspect we'll be spending our time um, just getting it ready, but after that we will have as much as we can out in the public domain because people are just fascinated and they want to just go online to the Sample website and see it. Next question. No questions. Chris, I understand that in the 1950s the Port Adelaide Football Club won six premierships in a row. Sorry, I didn't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, waited for the reaction. Now we'll carry on. And uh, you know, in the 60s, Sturt was five in a row. Do you have much on, on those two magnificent eras of football? I'm not sure that he's going to like my answer. We have a lot on the Sturt, um, but... <laughs> However, Port are developing their own history and they're very focused on that. So at this point in time, we don't have as much on Port, but that doesn't mean to say that we won't because they've got some um, crates that are full of items. And I said to Keith Thomas, you'd better be ready when you actually open it 
to be prepared to go through it. So at this, I know that there are, there are items out there, but we are well and truly busy enough with what we've got now, and we will get to that once they've sorted it. So we will get the microphone. It's only football. <laughs> Ollie. I think you can ask 15 different people and get 15 different... Im yes, but... Um, <laughs> yes, we are getting to that. More and more information is coming out, which is really useful, and to put it um, together and then do the research to actually underpin what that is. Um, and I think that, that we'll, we'll have much more of an idea. I, there's an interesting um, research about uh, Charles Kingston and the fact that he was the one who steered us towards working with the Victorian approach rather than the New South Wales approach, or could we could be playing rugby. But we're getting there. It's just a lot of these things, um, hearsay needs to be researched more, more ease, better, actually. Anthony. Yeah. Good question, actually. Um, with, the, with the five guys who were going through all the film and tape and painstakingly going through and cataloguing what was there, I kept saying to them, keep going because you'll find the tape of the 1972 match if you keep going. Well, they did. They kept going till the end and haven't found it yet. Um, I've got someone pursuing Carlton to see if, it's, it's, if there's a copy there. Um, it seems to have disappeared off the planet for the moment, but we don't give up. There, there are a lot of um, contacts to be explored, and at the moment the answer is no, we haven't found it, but we keep looking. So sorry about that. I mean, we all know it happened. We just need the footage. Thanks, Chris. I don't know whether they all really know. Uh, being a North Adelaide follower, North Adelaide were five points down, kicking against a five-goal breeze in the last quarter against Carlton and won by six points. Now, John Hunter's going to ask a question. John, if you didn't realise, was a top ruckman also for North Adelaide in the 50s and he's brought some of his memorabilia for Chris to look at today. John? There are some things that are beyond my knowledge. Um, and I've got a lot of football by osmosis, but I don't, I, I, I can vaguely remember that, but I'm sorry, that's all I've got. If you ask my husband, he would know every kick. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Sorry about that. I'll brush up. This one over there. Bob. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> True. 
<laughs> One last question. Okay, if not, Chris, thank you. Oh, sorry. Madeline. 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 Uh, I, uh, oh, sorry. I put this in this little story in your archives. In 1962, I was playing football for Yonder Football Club, the coldest place in the state. I went up on a mark coming down with six bucks on top of me. When they dragged me off the field, the, uh, the trainer attended to me. He happened to be the local vet. And he, as he was stroking my leg up, he said, uh, Now listen, fella, if you're a horse, we give you two chances. If I either shoot you, we'll put you out to start. I said, well, if I've got a choice, don't shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, David. Madeline, we'll give, we'll give you one last chance. Well, what we're doing, because the State Library don't want the burden of every medal there being genuine, um, we're getting some replicated, which takes the insurance burden from them, but also is a cushion in case something happens to the real thing. So um, we'll be pursuing some of those for the exhibition. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you for a very interesting talk, and we wish you well getting everything together for your exhibition next year. Please join me in thanking Chris.